Welcome to this lecture on metabolism. So metabolism, we've, we've recently talked about digestion and we've learned about the three macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, and we've thrown this word metabolism around. Um, so let's give it a definition and talk about it in a lot more detail. So metabolism, by definition, is the sum of all of the processes by which a plant or an animal uses food and water to grow, heal, and make energy for the body to use um, for all other functions. Um, remember that energy can take the form of mechanical energy, electrical energy, thermal energy, and chemical energy. And even within the human body, we'll see all of those different types of energies. And so ATP, which is uh, short for adenosine triphosphate, is basically that energy, that molecular currency um, that we'll talk about within the human body. Remember that calorie is the term that we apply to energy that exists within food. So calories are housed inside of carbohydrate molecules, fat molecules, and protein molecules. And so we basically take those molecules into the body through food, and then we digest them down to their most basic components, glucose, amino acids, and triglycerides. And then we convert those basic substances, those basic molecules, um, through metabolic processes. We further break those apart, um, change their shape, change their molecular makeup, um, and ultimately derive ATP, or the molecular currency, the energy, um, from those basic molecules. Um, calorimeter is just an interesting term. We will revisit this later on in the semester, but calorimeter is um, actually the way to measure the energy that is housed within foods. So the way to measure calories. So calorimeter. Uh, metabolism, again, um, well, because it is the sum of all of the processes by which we break down and then break down food for energy and then utilize that energy, we are necessarily talking about two sort of equal and opposite processes. So we're necessarily talking about all processes that break down and we're talking about all processes that build up. So catabolism are all the processes by which we um, break down more complex molecules into their simpler form, um, and in doing so, release energy. So I always like to think of cats as being really destructive. Like if you have ever had house cats, they might tear your furniture up or your wallpaper um, or your favorite sweater or your rugs. Um, so cats, I think of as breaking down. <laughs> Uh, so when we ingest food, we break down, like I just said, we break down larger carbohydrate molecules into the basic glucose molecule, we break down our proteins into amino acids, we break down our fats into triglycerides, um, and then ultimately break those three monomers or basic molecules down further and thus release energy from them. And then by, again, by like equal and opposite, anabolism is the synthesis or the building up, the creation of more complex molecules from the smaller ones. And in doing so, we store energy. Um, so anytime we build glycogen reserves in our liver or in our muscles, we are storing energy that way. And remember, glycogen is just stored glucose. Anytime we build triglyceride molecules in our adipose tissue, that's just stored fat. Um, and again, fat and glucose are, contain a lot of energy. So if we are building those up to store them in our bodies, we are literally storing energy that way. Um, and if I haven't said this yet, uh, this is a like a huge evolutionary uh, adaptation that humans have developed is this ability to be able to store energy. Um, because really, in, in the grand scheme of uh, Homo sapiens existence on planet Earth, um, it's been a very, very tiny window of time in which we've had such abundant food supply. So really throughout the vast majority of human existence on, on Earth, 
we've lived in basically times of feast and famine. Um, and we've really existed as hunter gatherers. And so during those times of famine, where we food is scarce, especially during winter um, and early spring before too much food has um, has come up, we in being able to store energy in our on our own bodies has been a, a basically a method of survival. So when food is plentiful, eat a lot and store, you know, max out the glycogen stores, um, but really start to build some fat stores. Try to literally try to fatten up for winter, like a lot of, um, like a lot of other animals still do. And then once the famine is over and the food is plentiful again, um, we don't need to build as many fat stores. But while the food is not there, we can rely on those fat stores. So that process of being able to build those uh, fat stores has um, historically served us really well. Right, so moving on. Um, adenosine triphosphate, just showing you the molecule, but you'll see um, a very similar sort of basic structure of amino acids. And then here, so triphosphate, um, tri, three phosphate, uh, phosphate groups. So here you see your one, two, and three phosphate groups. Um, you'll see if you if you read through this section in the textbook, you'll see mention of adenosine um, monophosphate and adenosine diphosphate. Um, and so, yeah, literally those those molecules exist to kind of build up to ATP. Or when we use ATP ultimately as an as energy, um, we will be left with ADP. And so diphosphate would just be two phosphate groups and monophosphate would just be one phosphate group. Um, so those are always circulating around in the body um, because we'll use them to build ATP. We're going to go through pretty and pretty briefly, but just touch on these uh, six different types of chemical reactions um, and then look at how look a little bit at how enzymes function. Um, but as I, as I said, metabolism is the sum, sum of all these processes in either breaking down or building up su substrates or substances, molecules. And <clears throat> when I'm talking about processes, I'm talking about chemical reactions. So this is just an introduction class. So we're going to really simplify all of these processes and basically look at the starting place and the end place. Um, but typically, in doing that, we're skipping over what could be a dozen different reactions that are actually playing out to get from the starting place to the end place. And so in those dozen different reactions that we're going to skip over, um, this is where we would see all of these different types of chemical reactions, dehydration synthesis, hydrolysis, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, um, redox reaction, and then, of course, the the function of enzymes. So let's look at what these six. So dehydration synthesis, sorry, this is a little fuzzy. Um, dehydration, removal of water. So, um, and synthesis is building. So this would be an anabolic process. So in the event that we were going to build glycogen stores in the body, we would take two basic glucose molecules and we would bind them together and then eventually add another, add another, add another. So dehydration synthesis is a type of reaction that is used in building glycogen stores. So you see that there are these available OH groups on either um, glucose molecule. If we pull the water out, if we dehydrate, pull water out, um, what, two hydrogens and one oxygen, then we can actually have the glucose molecules bind together at that oxygen, and we're left with H2O. Doesn't look like it, but that says H2O. I must have cut off. I don't know if I cut that off or what, but this would be two hydrogens and an oxygen. Um, so dehydration, removal of water, synthesis to build. Um, and then again, kind of equal and opposite would be a hydrolysis, hydro, water, lysis, break. So hydrolysis would be a catabolic process. So if we are digesting a carbohydrate molecule, um, we will hydrolyze the carbohydrate molecules, the, in, the individual glucose-glucose bonds, to release two singular glucose molecules. So maltose being one of our disaccharides, 
Um, if we add water, we release, we can break apart the bond of the oxygen. So hydrolysis, add water to break. Phosphorylation, so again, this is something we are gonna, we're gonna skip over a lot of phosphorylation reactions, but actually um, one that we, we're not really skipping over, we just don't talk about it so specifically, is when we actually form ATP from ADP. We're literally phosphorylating the ADP molecule by giving it an extra phosphate group. Um, but one of the things, what's shown here, is the phosphorylation of glucose, which is the very first step um, in um, glycolysis. But again, we are going to really simplify the process of glycolysis. Uh, you'll see that in the carbohydrate metabolism lecture. We're going to really simplify glycolysis. So we're going to kind of skip over this actual reaction. But you'll see, again, the basic glucose molecule um, we're going to use ATP to convert glucose to a molecule called glucose 6-phosphate. Um, and in doing so, we're going to phosphorylate the original glucose by giving it one of the phosphate groups from ATP. So you see now N-hexokinase being an enzyme, so here's the enzyme that makes this whole thing happen. So now we wind up with ADP because triphosphate gave away a phosphate group. And we have glucose 6 phosphate, where we have a phosphate group attached to the sixth carbon. Again, equal and opposite dephosphorylation, removal of a phosphate group. So here's glucose converted to glucose 6 phosphate, um, which eventually is converted to fructose 6 phosphate. Um, but ultimately, we are going to um, remove the phosphate group. Let's see if I've even shown it here. <laughs> I don't think I've shown it. I need to come up with a better picture. Um, ah, I see. Well, so dephosphorylation would be the removal, the ultimate removal of the phosphate group. So I've kind of cut it off because that would be later on down the chain. So these all still contain the phosphate group. Ultimately, the next step is, um, or, or the final step in this full reaction. So this is one of these um, processes where we have actually like 12 individual reactions. So one of the final steps is creation of this molecule pyruvate. Um, and ultimately, we would remove this phosphate group to create the molecule pyruvate. I'll get a picture of that and put it up on Blackboard because um, this clearly isn't the right <laughs> uh, diagram. But it's kind of nice anyway. You can see uh, some of these initial reactions in what is actually glycolysis. Um, and I'll show you, because I think I do have a complete overview of glycolysis, just to show you all the reactions. Um, I'll point out in that lecture where the dephosphorylation reaction is happening. And then oxidation reduction reactions. So again, um, I've been saying this equal and opposite thing, which is kind of the theme of balance, which is kind of a theme in this class, if you've hopefully you've noticed. Um, what's interesting about oxidation reduction reactions and, and separates them from hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis and um, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, is that a redox reactions literally are always happening at the same time as each other, whereas phosphorylation and dephosphorylation are kind of equal opposite, but they don't necessarily happen at the exact same time. So redox is interesting because it's literally just a transfer of an electron. And so as you transfer that electron, you naturally change. Um, well, and actually that's, that would be true of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. One molecule is getting phosphorylized while the other is getting dephosphorylized vice versa, and then the same thing with hydrolysis. Um, uh, and dehydrogen synthesis. No, hydro that, those are kind of separate. But understanding that in redox, we're necessarily, one molecule is necessarily giving away an electron while the other one is receiving that electron. So in the same reaction, we're seeing oxidation and reduction. Okay, so let's look at the example. So pyruvate, which is our uh, ultimately the end molecule of glycolysis. Again, we'll get there. Um, if we convert pyruvate to lactate, which would be in the absence of oxygen, um, <clears throat> we will actually reduce 
uh, let's see if I say this right. <laughs> We're gonna see a reduction reaction where pyruvate is going to gain an electron. So when it gains the electron, um, pyruvate is reduced. Pyruvate is reduced. Um, so where it gains the electron is here. We see this carbon-oxygen double bond, um, but now we're going to see carbon-oxygen in a single bond plus the uh, hydrogen atom. So the presence of the hydrogen atom indicates that this has been reduced because it indicates that it's gained an electron. Uh, whereas NADH has been oxidized because it's lost the electron, it's lost the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom is not itself the electron, but it kind of represents the transfer of the electron because the electron and the hydrogen atom will travel together. Um, so oxidation is happening here where NADH uh, ha has lost a hydrogen, lost an electron, and is thus now NAD. So um, there's this monomer over here. Monomer? Um, What's that word? <laughs> I can't think of it, but you know what I mean. Um, this this little word game to help you remember it. So oxidation is oil rig is the, it's going to bug me that I can't think of what that's called. So oil rig is our little memory word, and that stands for oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So where we see reduction, it reduced the, the um, electron, uh, let's see, the charge of the molecule is reduced, it's become more negative because it gained an electron. Um, so reduction is gain, gain an electron, reduce an electrical charge. Um, oxidation, the electrical charge is actually going to become more positive because an electron is lost. So in oxid, and um, the hydrogen atom is lost too, right? So oxidation is loss of the electron of the hydrogen atom. And then again, um, we'll see that here, where succinate undergoes oxidation. You see each carbon here has two hydrogens, and now they each have one to form this double bond between them. So they've lost, they each lost a hydrogen, they each lost an electron. Um, and now sharing uh, just two electrons between each other. And then FAD is reduced uh, because it gained, the electron it gained, the hydrogen atom. So this one is a little tricky, just kind of read the section of the book and talk yourself through it. Just say it out loud to yourself or say it to a friend, say it to, say it to somebody you live with but it's helpful to kind of talk through um, the difference in oxidation and reduction and just making sure you understand where the electron is going. This is also confusing terminology that I put over here on the bottom left. The oxidizing agent, so in this, let's see if I could give you the right example. Um, so in this, this is interesting. In this case, pyruvate is the oxidizing agent because it actually is the one that gets reduced. So pyruvate oxidized NADH. So we, these are really confusing terms, but we, we say oxidizing agent kind of to suggest what, it, what the molecule does to the other molecule. And then understanding that what happens to that molecule itself is the opposite of what it does to the other molecule, if that makes sense. So here pyruvate gets reduced, but pyruvate is the oxidizing agent to NADH. Similarly, NADH uh, gets oxidized, but it is the reducing agent to pyruvate. So just, again, talk yourself through that. <laughs> uh, all right, so then enzymes and cofactors and coenzymes. So we've talked about enzymes a, a bit in digestion. Um, so here is a, your schematic of the enzyme, and remember enzymes are proteins. Um, coenzy uh, coenzyme or cofactor, we'll use these words synonymously um, for this point, uh, but understand that they are a little different because the coenzyme um, is something derived from a vitamin and actually can carry an electron, whereas a cofactor is uh, actually typically a mineral. It doesn't necessarily, um, it's 
not protein based, it's just it's literally just a mineral. Um, but both in for a lot of enzymes, both uh, they may use one or the other. Um, sometimes they would use both. Um, but they allow the enzyme to actually work. So we will sometimes apply this word apo um, before the enzyme name um, to suggest that it's the inactive form. And then we have we'll have another name for the enzyme when it's in its active form. So you might remember um, pepsinogen. Uh, when we're talking about digestion in the stomach, uh, small intestine, excuse me, um, is the inactive form. No stomach gan, it's converted by hydrochloric acid to pepsin, which is the active form. So we're not using the APO there, but I'm remembering pepsinogen is the inactive form and that it gets converted to an active form. Excuse me. Uh, so in becoming an active form, this is where we see the coenzyme and sometimes also a cofactor binding to the hollow binding to the apoenzyme, um, which thus allows the substrate, whatever the molecule is that it's going to act on, to fit more exactly, and thus the reaction can occur. So enzymes are basically these little protein molecules that, that allow all these previous reactions that we talked about to occur. And if you remember when we looked at phosphorylation of glucose, hexokinase was an enzyme that allowed glucose to be converted to glucose 6-phosphate. And so that enzyme um, needs to actually allow glucose, needs to hold on to glucose to, to allow for that phosphorylation reaction, um, but it can't hold on to the glucose if it doesn't also have its coenzyme. Um, and then what you'll see in the B vitamin lectures is that NAD, NADP, and FAD are actually B vitamin derivatives. Okay, and then these are just like, just two slides here that are kind of fun. I think um, I'm not going to really go over them in much detail, but you know, pause the lecture and just stare at this. <laughs> um, but we're going to go through this in pretty good detail in the subsequent lectures. So we'll look at carbohydrate metabolism. Um, <clears throat> basically, we're going to follow glucose because typically fructose and, and galactose can come into the um, glycolysis pathway. Um, but they may also just be straight up converted to glucose at the site of the liver. Anyway, so we'll see glycogen, uh, we'll see glucose conversion ultimately to pyruvate and then pyruvate conversion to acetyl acid, acetyl acid, acetyl CoA. We'll go through the citric acid cycle, um, producing a lot of these uh, coenzymes, uh, which ultimately will give up their hydrogen atoms so that we can convert a bunch of ADPs phosphorylate a bunch of ADPs to ATP. Um, fatty acid synthesis or metabolism, not synthesis, fatty acids um, and glycerol will <laughs> uh, ultimately work to make acetyl-CoA more or less um, and then again travel through the electron transport chain and the Krebs cycle. Proteins, we're going to break those down to amino acids. Um, and some of the amino acids can be, can make pyruvate, some can make acetyl-CoA, and some will just go straight into the citric acid cycle. So ultimately, pretty much everything playing into this part down here, citric acid cycle is where we see the most uh, generation of these coenzymes. Um, and then electron transport chain is where we really make ATP. And then this is also just for your enjoyment. We'll revisit this concept when we talk about physical activity. Um, but our the energy systems in the body, free ATP, this doesn't, uh, yeah, so free ATP is like ATP that just is already there in the body that we made. Um, the phosphate, creatine phosphate system, glycolysis, and oxidative phosphorylation. So again, this is more physical activity based, but it's just kind of fun, I think, to look at. Um, so depending on what type of activity you're doing, the body's going to rely on one of these four different uh, energy systems. Um, so in a, in a miniature burst of energy, <laughs> you're going to use free ATP. Like basically, if you're running the 100 meter dash, that first step is free ATP. And then 
uh, most of the rest of the 100 meter dash, you're going to actually supply energy from the creatine phosphate system. It's a really quick um, energy production pathway. Also, really not a lot. We don't have a lot of creatine phosphate uh, to use, so it's really just for high burst activity um, or you know quick heavy lifting. And glycolysis is again where breakdown of glucose to run through the Krebs cycle. Um, still kind of a powerful reaction. Um, and then oxidative phosphorylation is actually where we're breaking down fatty acids to release ATP. And we'll see that fatty acids actually house a lot more um, energy as we've talked about, but we'll see why that is compared to um, glucose. And so for longer duration activities, uh, kind of at a more of a steady state so not super high power. Um, this is where we'll actually see most, we still see some energy provided by gly glycolysis, but more of our energy being provided by uh, that beta oxidation. Um, which again, sorry, I kind of misspoke there, but understanding that beta oxidation, beta oxidation is just for fatty acids, but oxidative phosphorylation is referring to the ATP production that comes from the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So that's why glucose still plays in here in this endurance phase. Um, but just interesting that the uh, the fatty acids are going to provide actually more of the substrate for Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. Anyway, you don't need to know this for now. This is kind of a preview to uh, when we talk about physical activity. Oh, I do have two more slides. <laughs> so alcohol metabolism. Um, Again, just understanding that alcohol actually is uh, does house energy. Um, so we, when we, when we break down uh, ethanol or basic alcohol, we do release acetyl CoA. Ultimately, we can convert it to acetyl CoA, um, but know that al acid aldehyde uh, is toxic to the body. So we do have to process it out in such a way that we um, make it not harmful. And so this is all going on in the liver. Um, but what's interesting about this path, pathway, the MEOS pathway, the microsomal ethanol oxidizing system, is that um, in, in chronic alcohol abuse, so where someone is consistently drinking um, too much alcohol really for the body, the MEOS pathway is actually more of the secondary metabolic pathway for alcohol abuse, or for alcohol, excuse me. Um, but it is also the pathway that will metabolize or detoxify other toxins that come into the body. So again, things like red 4D, food coloring, food dyes that are known to be toxic to the body, um, anything, any like air pollutants, water pollutants, uh, chemicals that are in our food that are toxic to us, um, smells if we walk by something, you know, odorous that the, you know, some certain types of paints can have um, air, air uh, fumes that we might breathe in through the air. Anyway, other toxins are also metabolized by the MUS pathway, but the body will preferentially give way to alcohol. Um, and then any other drugs that we might be using, um, uh, recreational drugs or illegal drugs, um, if we're um, co-consuming alcohol and drugs, the body's gonna, again, preferentially metabolize the alcohol. Um, and which could lead to intensified effects of the drugs and potential death. So that's like a really crash course, basic overview of why chronic alcohol abuse can be so dangerous to the body. Also, some common prescription drugs inhibit the MEOS pathway, um, which then uh, can become a real problem for the body where we might have buildup of that acetaldehyde, which is, again, toxic to the body.